and welcome to the Bright Minds of E-Commerce podcast. I'm Dana, founder of Bright Red Marketing, your e-commerce advertising specialists. We focus primarily on Facebook and Instagram ads, driving direct return on investment only for e-commerce stores. I started this podcast to share the inner workings of the e-commerce world, share success stories, as well as advice from experts. So whether you're thinking of starting your first e-com store or you're ready to scale to $500,000 months, this podcast is for you. So let's get started. Welcome to episode two. Hi, and welcome to the Bright Minds of E-Commerce podcast. Today we're here with Kate Toon. Kate Toon is a writing entrepreneur as well as a popular coach, speaker, author, and podcaster. Her digital education businesses, The Recipe for SEO Success, and The Clever Copywriting School have helped more than 8,000 small business owners grapple with the Google beast and write better content. Author of the Amazon bestseller, Confessions of a Misfit Entrepreneur, How to Succeed in Business Despite Yourself, Kate lives on the central coast of Sydney City, where she loves wandering on the beach with her son and her CFO, Chief Furry Office Dog, Pumple Moose. Welcome, Kate. Hello. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you. So for those of our listeners who aren't so familiar with your work, can you give us a little bit of background on how you got started in the world of SEO and copywriting? Yeah, so I worked when I left university, I went off and I worked in lots of different agencies. I ran events and then I worked in digital marketing when it was just starting, when people, not everyone had an email address and things like that. Like it was old school. And I worked building Marks and Spencer's website in the UK, which was a bit of a baptism by fire. And then came to Australia, worked in lots of big ad agencies like Ogilvy and, and places like that, mainly as a producer, project manager, more than a copywriter. And then I got pregnant. And realized I didn't want to do the long hours that agency life demands. So I started my own business about 11 years ago and just took all the skills because I've been working with you know big brands doing all different kinds of things, copywriting, SEO, information architecture, website builds. So I took all of that and then tried to package it into little services that I could offer. And over time, the big thing for me was there were just so many other people doing what I was doing, even back then. And so I was like, how do I get found on Google? I need to use all those skills I learned in SEO for big brands and try to apply them to my business. And then I did. I got to number one for lots and lots of keywords. And then people started asking me, how'd you do that? And then training was born and courses were born and it's kind of just grown. It's evolved over the years. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I've done your course. Your course is amazing. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for saying that, darling. (laughs) So, I mean, this podcast is specifically on e-commerce. So what's probably the biggest difference between e-commerce SEO and I suppose your traditional service-based SEO, if there is any? Well, there is. And and the way that I think the core things are the same. So the way that I've structured my course, for example, is that everyone learns about the tech. Everyone learns about keyword research. Everyone learns about SEO copywriting. Everyone learns about backlink building and measurement and content marketing. But the distinct difference is that obviously service-based business generally, they're going after local search terms. So, you know, I want a window cleaner. I don't just want any old window cleaner. I want a window cleaner in my suburb. So they have to do a lot more optimization around, you know, uh, their location, their maps, where they physically are, trying to get into that local pack that you see in the search results. E-commerce, you know, you can kind of do a Google My Business page and have an address and pretend that that's your HQ, but it's not really about that. Generally, people don't search for environmentally friendly coffee cup in location. Do you know what I mean? They're not so bothered. They'll want it in Australia potentially, so they don't have to get it shipped from the US. So it's more about building trust and trying to explain why people should buy that coffee cup, which I can buy from 50 other people. Why should I buy it from you? So what do you do on your site that makes me want to care about you as a business owner and therefore want to buy from you? Which doesn't sound like SEO, sounds like marketing to a degree. But if you sell this Frank Green coffee cup that I'm holding up that you can't see because this is a podcast, you know, (laughs) It's a very pretty Frank Green cup. It is. It's, and it's very big. Do I try and compete with Frank Green? Do I go, what keywords do I use? Do I mention the color of it, the size of it? Do I write copy that's different to what Frank Green wrote? Or do I write my copy? How do I use images? All that kind of stuff. So e-commerce is, it's, it has its own challenges. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I suppose because we work with solely e-commerce businesses, a lot of the challenges that we hear is around writing product descriptions, especially when they have tens of thousands of different products and they're very, you know, similar. Have you got any Mm. tips or, you know, secrets in how to write really good product descriptions? 
Yes. I mean, that's my bread and butter. So at the moment I'm writing product descriptions for Sanitarium for all their products, Wheat Bix and things. And I also wrote, I think, 80 product descriptions for chucks you know the sponges and the only <laughs> difference is that one sponge is bigger or it comes in a two pack or it's got thicker green stuff on top so if i can make those interesting you can make your products interesting i think too often people focus on the literal they try to describe the physical product it's this big it's this color they don't go beyond that and think how is this product going to change someone's life when are they going to use it? Where are they going to use it? Why are they using it? What sorts of people use it? How do they feel before they use it? And how do they feel after they use it? So again, we'll take the Frank Green coffee cup. Why is this better than any other coffee cup? Like you could physically describe it and say, look, it's, it's insulated. It holds this much coffee. But really, why does someone buy this coffee cup? You know, it's huge. So what kind of person's buying that? You know, so I'm a coffee addict. You know, you need to get your three shots in there. It's going to stay warm all morning to give you time to drink it. You could hit someone with this and probably decapitate them. I don't know. <laughs> trying to go beyond the features and then even then going beyond features to benefit. So it's a 500 ml coffee cup. That's the feature. The benefit is you can get more coffee in it. That's the benefit. But the advantage is you can drink, you can buy a coffee at 6 a.m. and still be drinking it at midday. Yeah. That, so you go beyond the obvious. And I think too many people focus on the literal and don't think about the story. Because what we're trying to do with product descriptions is we're trying to elicit emotion. By the time someone gets to your product description, they already want to buy the product. They are looking for you to make them feel good about the purchase decision they're about to make. They're looking for affirmation. So yes, they want detail. They want to know that it does what it's supposed to do. But they also want to imagine themselves using it. So I think it's storytelling a little bit as well. I think that's a great way of, especially when you're dealing with something that's so many products, like especially with trucks, like I don't know how you, I'm going to go check out their website soon and see what you've done. <laughs> But like they've changed, they've changed it since I did it. But yeah, it is hard. And the thing is, you shouldn't think, oh, I've got 200 products because that's overwhelming and you'll never get there. What are your 10 best performing products already? Take those, make them better. Then the next week, commit yourself to rewriting two a week. You know, in a year's time, you'll have 104 new product descriptions. Because if you try and write them in a big lump, they will all sound end up sounding the same and you'll run out of ideas. There's only so many stories you can tell in one week. There are, exactly. You know, but you've also got to really get into the mindset. This is Sue. Sue hates washing up. She'd much rather use the dishwasher, but sometimes she has the cleaner pan. And that's why she likes chucks because they don't fall to bits. They don't, all the sponge doesn't go down the plug hole. You know, they last the test of time. They're not smelly. They're not, there's things you can talk about, you know, but you have to get into the mindset of Sue about to clean a pan what does she want how does she feel what's she frightened of what's she been doing all day yeah. you know how's she going to feel better after this that's what you need to do i think that's amazing i love it you sort of touched on this in the beginning but what are the most important elements of an e-commerce site that you kind of should have as your focus for seo from an seo point of view i think you know it starts right at the beginning you know choosing the platform that you want to be on are you shopify are you shopify are you going with wordpress and woocommerce there is no seo real seo advantage to any of the platforms anymore they used to be but now they're much of a muchness the difference is that woocommerce lets you get in there and fiddle you can change things you can do more you can optimize your site more but there's a payoff for that you have to worry about backups and hosting and security go with Shopify. It's kind of pretty good out of the box, but you you can only do what Shopify allows you to do. And you have to always remember that Shopify owns your site, not you. They own you. Whereas with WooCommerce, you own your site. So choosing the right platform is more about what type of person you are. Are you someone that likes to fiddle or are you someone that just wants to set and forget? So if you like to fiddle and want control, WordPress is better. If you don't, Shopify, big commerce, those are all good. After that, it's choosing a great domain name. So having the product that you sell in your domain name doesn't necessarily give you an advantage from an SEO point of view, but it helps people understand. So if you say, you know, we are Bob's baby bibs, well, I'm pretty clear that you're selling baby bibs. So having a name that's relevant and that's memorable and that's brandable, that's really, really important. And then after that, thinking about site structure. So, so many e-commerce sites I see, their main navigation 
is not their shopping categories. It's things like about and delivery and FAQ. It's like, that's so secondary. Your main navigation should be the, the categories of what you sell. So that within 10 seconds of hitting your site, I can see, yeah, you're called Bob's Baby Bibs, but you also say du- sell dummies and cloths cloths and wraps and cots and prams and I get that I don't need to read any copy that says we sell blah 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 it comes straight through from the nav so those are my top three things platform domain and navigation but there's a whole lot more but I'll I'll let you get a word in edgeways (laughs) (laughs) no that's fine I'm loving this I know that a lot of people think SEO means blog how important is a blog for an e-commerce site well one of the main reasons people like blog posts is because they give a reason for Google to come back and crawl your site. So Google does look on for new content on your site. But the truth is that Google doesn't necessarily reward the most consistent content or the newest content. It rewards the best content. So yes, by all means, if you can write a really well-written 2,000 word blog post that's engaging and interesting, and you can do that every week, by all means, do it. It will be useful. You can repurpose that content onto social media and all your platforms. Fantastic. Most of us can't do that. So if you can't write a blog post of that quality, please don't write four 300 word useless ones. They won't do any good. They'll take up your time. And remember, you're always adding new product to your site. So there's always new things to crawl. But less about SEO, more about brand building and building up what what we call in Google world expertise, authority, and trust, EAT. Blog posts help you build a relationship with your customers and give them a reason to buy from you rather than Kmart. Now, there's lots of ways these days to build up a relationship. We've got Instagram stories, fantastic way of building up stories, Facebook Live, LinkedIn stories, lots of other ways to build up content other than blogs. They are not the golden ticket they used to be. You need to think of it less about ranking and more about building relationships, showing that you're an authority on bibs and that you're and talking about why you set up your business and where you source your materials and telling stories of customers that bought your product and loved it. That's going to make me love your brand and that's going to yeah. make me loyal. It's that kind of endearing content that makes me want to buy from you and not someone else. Yeah. So it's less about SEO from a technical perspective, but using it as a way to build that brand and make sure people trust you and they like you. Yeah. And it's hard with blog posts. Um, They say something like 4 million blog posts are published every minute. There's there's something like 10 billion. uh, There's a ridiculous amount. So again, you know, you really have to think about what is the goal of this piece? You know, what are my chances of ranking? And if you want it to, if the goal is SEO, you need to do keyword research. You need to pick a phrase that you can compete on. If the goal is relationship building, don't worry quite so much about SEO. You can focus on just having a really lovely tone of voice and whatever. If you're focusing on conversion, then it should be your top 10 featured products. If you're focusing on building relationships with other e-commerce stores, then you should be ego baiting them by featuring their products. So think about the goal of your post before you publish it. And don't just think you have to publish posts for SEO because you don't anymore. There's lots of other ways of doing it. Yeah, that's amazing because I know a lot of uh, my clients especially will sit there and go, oh, we need to keep posting blogs and we'll use them on Facebook. And that makes a lot of sense that it's more about that relationship building and then worrying about it afterwards. Yeah. I mean, if you can, do. Yeah, you know, like obviously. that's why, you know, people like ASOS and whatever, we've got a team of 30 people, they can pump out a blog every few days. But people like us, we can't. So we have to pick our battles. You yeah. know, maybe we've got five hours a week to spend on digital marketing. What should we spend that on? Yeah. Is it writing a blog post or is it posting Instagram stories or is or it updating your product descriptions? <laughs> or updating product descriptions? Yeah, this is it. And some things move the SEO needle very quickly like improving your site speed, reducing your image sizes, writing better product descriptions, sorting out your navigation. Some things move the needle very slowly, adding alt tags to images, writing three crappy blog posts that no one's going to read. So it's about picking your battles and picking things that take minimal time but have maximum impact. Amazing. I love it. Are backlinks still as relevant in terms of building that SEO? Yeah, I just nodded my head frantically and then realized no one can hear me doing that. Yes, absolutely. So often you have to think of your website. This is my little cheesy analogy and you will have heard this before. I love cheesy analogies. Uh, I love an analogy. So think of your website as a little island, you know, in the middle of the ocean and it's beautiful. and It's got gorgeous resorts on it and discos and the best restaurants. 
But unless you hook up a ferry service or build an airport, no one can get to your beautiful island. So yes, backlinks are a way for traffic to get to your site. So physical people, physical eyeballs seeing your site. But also in Google world, every link to your site passes what we call SEO juice. Like it's kind of like glorious goo. So if you link to me, I'll be on your podcast, I'll be on your site and you'll link to my bio. They say Kate Toon is this person. And, and Google will go, look, Bright Red Marketing is a really good website. It looks really official and great. And they're linking to Kate. So they must think Kate's pretty great. And so they give me kind of a thumbs up. So it's about getting links from high quality sites. It's more about quality than quantity. And it's about understanding that social media links don't count for building up that authority. They bring traffic, but they don't bring juice. Yeah. So having lots of links on Facebook isn't going to do anything or Instagram. So you know, the best way for e-commerce stores to think about this is do the obvious, get yourself on lots of directories, ideally free ones. You don't want to be paying a lot for directories, write some guest posts for other sites that have similar products, but aren't competitive, collaborate with other e-commerce stores and go, Hey, look, you sell shoes. I sell handbags. How about we link to each other and recommend each other's products. And then things like this, building your brand by talking about your business on podcasts or in the media, all those things are great way of great ways of building backlinks to your site. And they definitely do count because once you've optimized your site and written your product descriptions and you've speeded it up, what is there other than content marketing and backlink building to differentiate you from to differentiate Bob's bibs from Sue's bibs? How does Bob win? The only way he can win is to get more people to point to his site. Amazing. Is that something where like using influencers and in, especially like more influencers with blogs rather than just posting pretty photos on Instagram. Is that something that would work as well? Would I just think when I'm in e-commerce groups and talking to people who are in my memberships and courses, often Instagram relationships are very disappointing. So I think you have to be so open and honest with them about what you're going to get, what they're going to give you. As you said, you know, the classic one picture on Instagram and you paid them 300 bucks, you know, what else are they going to do to support that? It's funny, I'm a few of the people in my course have actually asked me to be an influencer for their stuff, like clothes and stuff. You know, and I go the extra mile. So yeah, I will mention it on Facebook. I'll do an Instagram story. I'll put it on my wall. I'll put it in my groups. And I will write a really nice post about it. Like I won't just take what they've written. But yeah. And I also think about the influences you're choosing. I'm sure you talk to your guys about this. Don't go after the big names. Go after people who are going to benefit as much from this relationship as you are and build each other up. You know, so I'm a big fan of building up people who are not necessarily beneath me but people who are working their way up rather than trying to build relationships with people who've already made it because the people who've already made it they don't care about me they don't they, I might get on their thing but they're not going to really push it because they don't need me so try and find someone who needs you as well as you needing them and that's a great way of looking at it because yeah influencers can get a little bit we use influencers and we get some great results for our clients with it. But we've had so many, much like what you've just said, we have so many people that have gone and spent $100 here, $500 here, $1,000 there for one post on an Instagram account that is followed by bots. So I think yeah. if you can kind of build it that way, I think that's a, a better way of doing it. Uh, the good analogy with link building and I think marketing in general is the harder it is to build the link, the more worthwhile that's going to be. So like, for example, if you can get yourself on a free directory, well, then all your competitors can too. But if you can come up with a newsworthy PR story about the fact that your brand is supporting the local dog's home and donating X amount of your products and that gets in the paper and then they link to you from their digital newspaper and also maybe you get on the local news. Yeah, that took a long time to set up. That took a big commitment. But that kind of link is going to pay you back for months and months and months and build your brand and build your reputation. Whereas just, so, you know, quick wins get crap results. I think yeah. sometimes you've got to, got to work a bit harder. 100% agree. In terms of SEO, when do you recommend people DIY versus, you know, getting professional help? I think it comes down to two core things. One, your mindset and two, your money. So I think that everybody with, if you're running your own business, there is a requirement for you to understand all the elements of your business. So you should have a little bit of understanding about accounting, a little bit of understanding about how your website works, a little bit of understanding about SEO, design, copywriting. And um, I just think that's what we take on as business owners. You can't just be like, well, I only like making berets, so I'm not going to do any of the other bits because I just want to make berets. Well, 
don't start your own business then because you'll be making berets about 30% of the time and the rest of the time you'll be accounting, marketing, stockpiling, stock taking, blah, blah, blah. So I think the thing is to try it. And that's why, I mean, my whole business model is about letting people dip their toe in and then their foot in and then fully submerging themselves. You will find that you either have the right kind of mindset for it or you don't, like you enjoy the wins. For example, I hate accounting and it doesn't matter how many courses and books and whatever, I still just can't seem to click it in. It doesn't get, I'm 11 years into doing this. I still struggle with it. So I understand a bit, but I decide to outsource that. But I made that decision from a position of knowledge and power. I didn't just blindly hire an accountant. So I think you don't know until you've tried it. So try it first, then make a decision and don't get a recommendation of some random on Facebook. Don't go and Google and SEO agencies and pick one. Don't respond to the emails from Sanjit saying, greetings of the day, I guarantee (laughs) number one rankings. Talk to someone like you or like me and get a personal recommendation from someone who knows what that recommendation means and has a reputation to uphold. Like you are not going to recommend anyone dodgy because it will come back on you. And I think often on Facebook, people recommend people to be nice because their cousin's mother-in-law's son is doing a bit of SEO and they want to be nice, but they are not the judge of whether that person's doing a good job or not. So yeah. I think that goes for all industries. It does. Even but SEO mine, seems to have a particularly bad reputation and a lot of dodgy people in it. it so does. I so think it goes for a lot. advertising though. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. It's again, I think it's because both of those are seen. There's a lot of sort of seven figure entrepreneurs saying, look, I made X amount of dollars in a night. And whenever you get that kind of person in that industry, it drags the industry down. And I think yeah. you're very true. That ha- You don't really get that in copywriting or design. You don't get many people I think going. it's too much work. And it's like, if someone writes you <laughs> copy, but like if someone writes copy, you can read it even if you don't any, know anything about copy and go, yes. that's good copy. With what you yeah. and I do, there's a lot behind the scenes. You can do SEO and have no idea what's happening and you're paying yeah. someone you don't know. I can run ads for you and you could have no idea what's happening, especially with some of the yes. dodgy ones out there that will literally run your ads in their ad accounts. You can't even see anything. Yeah, And then you're exactly. just blindly trusting that, you know, that's happening. If someone's going to yeah. write your copy, you can see it and then you... Yeah, you it's the behind it. the scenes. It's the behind the scenes kind of geeky stuff yeah. that is an area of kind of like mystery and people are like, oh, no, I'm doing something special that no one else does. And it's like, no, they're not. They're just doing what everyone else does. But yeah, it's tricky. So I think who you get your recommendation from is really important. And, and knowledge is power. You know, people say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. I don't agree. I think a little knowledge will stop you getting your bum burnt by a bad person. 100% agree with you on that one. In all areas of marketing, not In even just... In all areas. Yes, 100%. Is there any other things related to e-commerce SEO that you think are important that we may have missed? I'll leave you with one big tip and that's images. And you know how important images are for e-commerce SEO, uh, just for e-commerce in general, because sometimes it's all you've got. You don't have a big product description. You're relying on the image to do the sell. So there's all the things around consistency and clarity and good quality. But when it comes to SEO, we really need to look at two elements, the physical size of the image, the dimensions, because often you'll have your images that you've taken and be sent to you from your photographer, or you'll be getting them from the brand and they'll be like 10,000 pixels by 8,000 pixels. And you've just uploaded that to your page without reducing the file size. Believe me, it happens. And that's going to really slow your site down because the image on the page is only like 400 pixels by 400 pixels, but you're loading that giant image into the page. So that's one thing. The other thing is K size. So every image, the more complex the image has a physical file size. And again, you need to be reducing that as much as possible. I use a tool called tiny PNG, which is a free one. You drag the image in. Yeah, there's heap, cute panda. There's heaps of them. I think you should optimize your images before you upload them to the site. There are tools that will optimize them when they're on the site, but it's better to just do it beforehand. And again, if you're thinking, oh my God, I wonder how bad my images are, pick your top 10 products, start there. Download the image, resize it physically, reduce the case size, name it really well. So blue hyphen jumper hyphen four hyphen piglet dot JPEG, upload it again, write a nice alt tag, boom and then do the next one and the next one and it's the kind of job you can do on a friday night with a glass of wine watching netflix on the other screen it doesn't take your whole brain but if you can reduce your page load and your website speed down by one second you could move from page 40 to page one you know it's a 
big thing. It's probably one of the biggest things in SEO and one of the biggest issues with it is generally images. So that's my final tip. Wonderful. And I know with e-commerce sites, if they've got, you know, some of our clients have got, you know, 10, 15, 20,000 products, you've got that yeah. many photos and there's multiple photos per product it, that could really slow everything down really quickly. And it could feel overwhelming to think, how do I tackle that? But again, just pick your top 10 products then your next 10, then your next ones. You've done a hundred products, then just commit to doing a few a week and know that every time you upload a new product, you're going to do it properly from now on. And then in a year's time, all those hundreds of products will all be updated. So just eat the elephant one bite at a time. That's it. I love it. I love it. So now we have a couple of questions we ask every podcast guest at the end of our show. Do you have any secret strategies, routines or habits that you personally follow every day to help you stay on track in your business? I walk my dog every morning and get a coffee and listen to a podcast and try and come back to my screen with one thing to say on social media, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's a murder podcast or a business podcast or a podcast about storytelling. That's my little daily inspiration. And sometimes I turn my audio off and just think about things. Isn't that terrifying? So that's my daily routine. I love it. I love it. And do you have a favorite business book? Um, my own. Confessions of a Misfit Entrepreneur, How to Succeed in Business Despite Yourself. I must admit, I'm not a huge business book reader. So I have a whole shelf of them behind me, most of which I haven't, I haven't read, but they look good. I, um, I get a lot of my creative inspiration from actual book books, novels and nonfiction books. So other than my own, I'm afraid I don't. That's all right. And favorite <laughs> podcast? Sounds like you might have a couple other than your oh, own. Oh, I do. Because I know you've got your own, own podcast. I mention my own. <laughs> yeah. I really like one called Reply All, which is all about kind of technology it sounds really geeky and it is quite geeky but I love it I love this American life because the production of that podcast is beautiful and the stories are amazing and then I have to admit I do listen to criminal and case file which are just horrible murder podcasts but <laughs> I don't know why it's like my dirty secret those are my main ones wonderful and then lastly do you want to just tell everyone a little bit about your SEO nibbles and your courses and from go from there yeah. So SEO nibbles, not nipples. That is my starter <laughs> course. So it's a free little three day course, minimal effort. And the goal of that course is to help you decide your question that you ask. Do you want to DIY it? Do you want to hire someone? If you want to hire someone, what should you be asking? And then after that, if you do decide you want to do it, there's a sort of what I would call a, that's the toe dip. The foot dip is the 10 day SEO challenge, which is like the first 10 things to think about. And it covers off some of the stuff we've talked about today, duplicate content issues, image optimization, speed, writing title tags and things like that. And then after that, I've got a monster course, the one that you've done, which is launching again next year, uh, which has an e-commerce module within it that you can do as well as all the other bits that I've talked about. It is definitely a monster course, but well worth it. <laughs> It's a kind of a core, it's more of a resource. People come back to it again and again. Oh, and I should say, um, I have a group on Facebook called I Love SEO, where I just put daily little tips and ideas and little micro tasks that you can do to just try and achieve something on a busy day. I love it. Well, thank you very much for joining us. It's been lovely to have you. It's been great. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the second episode of the Bright Minds e-commerce podcast. If you want to know more, need a recap, or want to learn more about Kate Toon and her programs, please head on over to our show notes. You can find them at www.brightredmarketing.com.au forward slash show notes forward slash episode two. The link will also be in the episode description. On that show notes page, there's a section for questions. We'll be launching our first Q&A episode very soon, so I'd love to feature your questions. Or if you know someone who'd be a great guest on our show or you want to come join us, you can use that section to apply. If you love the show, we'd really appreciate it if you could leave us a review. It'll help us reach new listeners and help us know that we're on the right track. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>